Welcome to the Knowledge Chamber. I'm your host, Robert Hess. Native code, managed code, sometimes there's confusion there. Lately, we've been seeing a big resurgence in the use of native code. We had the Going Native program that we just did a few months ago that you can still get online. Plus, at TechEd, there's going to be a pre-con session, a day-long pre-con seminar, all about writing C++ applications. This can be taught by Kate Gregory. Uh, here joining me today, I have Herb Sutter. He's from the Visual Studio team, as well as being the chair of our efforts at standardizations on C++. Is that right? Yes, and of the ISO C++ committee. So the, the, the big overall committee that's mm -hmm. you know, you know, industry-wide managing C++ is moving forward. You're managing that conversation. Yeah, right. and internally at Microsoft, a, a lot of us are busy uh, working at, at, at how we can continue to improve the C++ compiler for Windows and contribute things to the world because C++ is moving faster than ever right now. It's been a really exciting time, a bit exhausting, but really exciting. So, I mean, why is it? Why is C++, I mean, from my standpoint, suddenly getting more visibility? I'm, I mean, lately I've been doing a lot of C-sharp programming because I haven't sure. touched C++ for quite a while, uh, but suddenly I'm hearing everyone talk about C++. Why is that? There's been a resurgence of interest for a couple of related reasons. Uh, first of all, managed code is perfectly good, and it's something people should reach for and use, uh, C-sharp and other managed languages. But understand for what? Use the right tool for the right job. So that's when you want to optimize for programmer productivity, where your biggest cost in your development cycle is programmer time, and you want to shorten that and reduce it. If that's your biggest cost, that's perfectly appropriate. That's why managed languages were so widely used in you know, late 1990s and through much of the 2000s, especially in inter internal IT departments, not just there, but as an example of where if you've got a few people developing an in-house company line of business application that may not be too huge or too demanding, that's a perfect example of where you can use managed languages effectively because your biggest cost is that programmer time. So if you've got a, if you're if you're Boeing and you've got an internal programmer team that's writing, you know, payroll management forms and stuff like that, doing that in, in C sharp or other managed language is probably the right thing to do because there it's how quickly can you get the job done and how many programmers you have having on the job is more important to you than the fact that this payroll form is faster than that payroll form. <laughs> yeah, and in particular, because there the heavy lifting is usually done in the server on a database anyway. And if you're talking about now the client application, you want to get that up and running as quickly as you can with as little programmer effort as you possibly can, reuse a lot of existing components and widgets. It's a, a great use of time because there in particular, you can live with the, uh, the, the fact that managed languages don't optimize for performance. And if, if you can tolerate that, that's perfectly fine. And that they don't give you the control that you need. When you have more demanding applications, and it turns out that there are large classes, not just one class, but large classes of applications in the industry, server side, client side, mobile devices, that are demanding, that do require performance efficiency, where your biggest cost is not programmer time, but watts, or how much can I get done with the small mobile hardware? That's where you need the control and power and expressiveness of a native language, and in particular C++ is the king of that, because it's the king of, of low-cost abstractions. You still get classes, virtual functions, you still get generics, and you still get templates that can be specialized, powerful abstractions, lambda functions now, and, and much more, but it's all designed to be low-cost, so that you can express your code in this rich way, and yet have it cost nothing or almost nothing routinely, because it's designed to be heavily optimizable. So it's partly the performance, but also you have control. In native code, in C++, you always know exactly where your objects are, what your layouts are, if you choose to take control of that. The defaults are easily usable. They don't require much time. But when you want that control, you can always get it. And that matters more, for instance, in mobile devices, where we're asked to be delivering these new user experiences. Not just, you know, WIMP interfaces anymore, but sensor-based touch UI, automatic, uh, uh, or auto, uh, augmented reality kinds of applications, and things like that, where we're asked, being asked to do a lot with a small amount of hardware, and at low power, that's where efficiency is king. If you can run twice as efficiently, you can run twice as long on that battery, you can run twice as fast on that mobile device. So, so if you're concerned about your user's battery life on their phones, you want to take and write in C++. Yes. Otherwise, if you don't care, then you write in C Sharp. And if you're plugged into the wall, you may think you don't care, except that power is by far the biggest cost in a data center. Power and servers together are roughly 88% of all the costs of running a data center. Oh, really? Which means that if you can run your application twice as efficiently, you can run on an elastic compute cloud that's twice, that's half the size, and you can run it using half the power. And if you look at the, the breakdown of costs associated with applications that run in data centers, cloud-based applications, programmer effort isn't even in the rounding, isn't even a rounding error. 
because your biggest costs are machines and power. And that's permanently going to be that way. So like. native code would be good for that standpoint. Exactly, because you want that efficiency. But remember, it's also efficiency and control because you can have the powerful abstractions and still they optimize away to, to nothing or nearly nothing mm -hmm. all the time, but you always have control over exactly what's going on. That you know exactly how objects are laid out, you know exactly when resources will be reclaimed because by default, C++ doesn't need garbage collection because it ties object lifetimes and resource lifetimes to blocks of code, to other objects. And once you've said that by construction, how your program depends on each other, cleanup becomes largely automatic. Having said that, if you do want uh, other lifetimes, like heat-based lifetimes, we now have smart pointers that do that for you in a standard way. So we can't just, we used to say, oh, just roll your own smart pointer. That's what we do. It's C++'s reference counting. Yeah, yeah. Go roll your own. Yeah. It's, uh, that's our job. Uh, no, it's our job to provide standard ones so that everybody can use the same things, and we've now done that, so that in portable C++ code, you can write code that is as clean, as type safe, and memory safe as in any other modern language, but doesn't sacrifice flexibility and control, and also is screaming fast. Mm -hmm. Clean, safe, and fast. Now, can, I can give you an example in a minute if you like. Sure, yeah, we'll take a look at that. But uh, one question is, like, when you talk about how you know, C-sharp is good for when programmer productivity is important, mm -hmm. um, does that inherently mean that C++ is more difficult to use? No, it, however, C++ has earned a reputation in the past for being obstinate. That you had to put a space between the closing uh, angle brackets of templates. If you have nested templates, like, why? It was a, a thing you would mock C++ about. Or you declare a local variable, and you have to repeat its type exactly, which could take half a line on your, on your screen. Why? And so a lot of the time, when you're optimizing for one thing or another, like you're optimizing for programmer productivity, or you're uh, optimizing for efficiency and control, Often, there's this big, nice middle ground where there's no trade-off to be made because you can get both. So in the examples I just gave, you can frequently get both. But when a choice is, has to be made between the two, managed languages will always say, we'll opt for more overhead because it makes programmers' lives easier if there is a fundamental tension. So we will require always-on garbage collection. We will require running on a virtual machine. We will require, or and hopefully optimize away, JIT compilation and things like that. We will require metadata to be available. All of those things add cost. They make life easier, but there's no way to opt out in general. Mm -hmm. And so they incur a cost whether you use it or not. C++ is, always makes the other choice. If it would cost you something, you don't pay unless you use it. So we'll still give you the feature. We'll give you a way to opt into it, but we won't make it the default and force it on everybody if it's going to incur a penalty on programmers even who don't use it and programs that don't use it. Mm -hmm. But there's a big sweet spot where you can get both. And it's, it's very happy when you can have your cake and eat it, too. Turns out that's a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. so, so developers that are writing applications at Microsoft are using C++ for a lot of their stuff. Yes. Mostly yeah. the, the products in the platform code, uh, which is needing to be optimized for speed, optimized for energy, and stuff like that. They are focused on writing native applications. So if you think of how C++ is used, is used at Microsoft, at Microsoft we're used to build all the platforms. So it's the tool that builds the platforms, and it builds all the demanding applications that run on the platforms. So we build Xbox's operating system, and the vast majority of games that run on Xbox. We build Windows, and the vast majority of Windows client code that's written at Microsoft also is written in C++, because that's where you want the control, the performance, and it's not just to build the lower level, but to build much of what rises above it. Mm -hmm. You get to a certain point where you, then you build, you can build managed code, you can other, use other kinds of languages, and that's great too, and that has its place, and you should always use the right tool for the job, but we primarily use it to build the platforms, and most of our code that is run on the platforms is native code. Mm -hmm. And, and partially, I guess, is because it's a competitive landscape, mm -hmm. and in order to get that competitive edge, we need to make sure, and any other, any other companies has a com competition going on between their applications, they need to focus on making the best possible applications they can, yeah. which includes not just the user interface, not just the visual pixels on screen that's doing mm -hmm. stuff, but also the, the speed and the efficiency and the throughput that they're getting. Yeah. So if, if com competition is not a driving factor, then managed code is fine. Or if competition is a driving factor, then you probably want to go to a native code. It depends how you, how you mean competition, because it, the question just is, for my, for my application, first, is my biggest cost engineering ta talent and time, 
including time to market because there's mm -hmm. you know build time and things like that. Is that my biggest cost, or and 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 if it is, even if is my application sufficiently non-demanding where I can tolerate overheads on my on my target hardware on my user's target hardware? If the answer is yes, go for it. So mm -hmm. sometimes people will say, oh, line of business applications are a great example of things that should be run in, written in managed code. And so we were talking about like the server side of a client server system, traditional. And I'll, I mostly agree with that. When it's second party, meaning in-house, a lot of business applications, you know, an IT department builds for their own users, because generally they're your biggest cost is their developer's internal time. Because it's not being distributed widely, you do most of the work off in a back end anyway that's not managed, it's the database or something, and so you get the efficiency anyway. But as soon as you even look at third party line of business applications, they get sold to other companies. They get distributed widely to millions and millions of seats in the industry. Those ones are predominantly written in native code. Because, uh, put it this way, if you're going to build a big piece of software of, of substantial size, you need abstractions. We can't write everything by hand. We have to use libraries that, that use other libraries and we build mm -hmm. the world on this but to be able to express very large scale problems. If you are in a performance critical environment, or you need the flexibility to express uh, to express exactly what you want without it costing you, you have to build those abstractions, otherwise you can't build large software, it's the only way we know how, but you want those abstractions to cost you as little as possible. If every new layer of abstraction is carrying along with it a large penalty, those add up quickly. And that's why C++ is all about efficient abstraction. I can build these things up, libraries of libraries, genericity templates, all this good stuff, but they optimize away, they're by design to nothing or nearly nothing, so that I can have the abstraction without that cost. And of course, because we want the flexibility to let the programmer express exactly what he wants to say, it turns out that there's usually more options available, template specialization and other options, to let the programmer say exactly what he means, because that way he can give the right semantics with the least overhead of exactly what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. If you can express exactly what you want, we can optimize that much better than if you give us a vague idea and we're not sure, and so we have to hedge our bets, right? It just it makes sense on principle. Yeah. Now, when I first started writing C++ code, this was you know, back in the 70s, 80s, um, C++ was a pre-compiler. Um, and so the notion was, you know, you're writing, you're writing your, C, your C code with these other added things to it that C, the C++ pre-compiler could then compile into C code, and then you compile that in a C compiler. Um, and I always felt because of that that you were kind of limited to what you could do as well as the language was kind of ugly. Uh, to a certain extent. How has C++ evolved since that point? Well, first of all, that hasn't been the mainstream of C++ compilers for 20 years now. But it is true, that's how the first decade started. Bjarne Sturstrup, when he invented C++ and kept refining it, he built it as a product called CFront, which, as it mm -hmm. implied, was a, a front-end um, translator that spit out C code, which would then be compiled. And it wasn't really so much that that, well, that was an implementation detail of his compiler. It didn't affect the design of the language. What did affect the design of the language was, since the beginning, very strict C compatibility. C++ would not be as popular as it is today, it would never have taken off like it did, if it wasn't so high fidelity backward compatible with C, being largely pure extensions to C. That means that you had to be compatible with some cruft too. But, so, but, other, but the reason we're having this discussion is because it was the right decision, because now C++ matters, because you have this path from people using C code, and there's still many people writing new C applications that have a path to, they can bring those code bases forward and that programmer knowledge forward to a language that is just as flexible, more flexible in, in strong abstraction, and just as efficient in native code. In fact, very often those abstractions make your program faster than C. So the standard example is if you have uh, called the, the, the C++ standard sort function and pass it a lambda function which generates a functor and you're sorting a, a, a vector of integers. You know, so very low overhead container mm -hmm. and you've got all this, these abstractions. You've got a function object. You've got a, a generic algorithm and you're calling this. It typically screams compared to C Q sort which is much lower level and more direct, because QSort, you might remember, takes a void star and everything, and you cast the voidness right. away to the right type, but everything's an indirection. Turns out that, is, that completely defeats optimizations in many cases. Whereas this much prettier, cleaner code in C++ that uses much stronger abstractions actually screams. It runs way faster 
because you're able to say exactly what you want, and the abstractions give you a power that you don't get in low-level C code. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, C compatibility is a, a very important part of the story, and we have never relinquished that. We've always kept that, because it's a big asset to have that compatibility. But now we're more to a language compatibility rather than a compiler-level compatibility. Exactly, right. yes. And so for the last 20 years, we've had C++ compilers that, on their own, directly emit native code. That's long been right. the, the standard fare. And the, the fact that we can take this language, and even in a backward compatible way with previous C++, the first standard, make it add features to make it simpler, that's quite a trick. But the way you do it is by adding the right abstractions for things people have to write by hand today, and that makes, gives you new features that actually make it a simpler language. Let me show you an example of that. Sure, I'd love to. Because here's just a very quick example that was put together by Stefan Lavave of our team for the Going Native conference. And so, thank you very much, Stefan. I'm <laughs> going to borrow your example. And it illustrates some of the features of C++11 for people who may be used to older C++ and think, oh yeah, isn't that that crufty language where you have to, your, your program takes three times as long to write and there's all this manual stuff and, and management. How modern can it be? So here we have a simple program, which could be even simpler, but I made a certain function a function just because. Just for the fun of it. Just, yeah. just to be able to illustrate a point. It could be even shorter than this. Sure. But I start with main. I have a vector of future strings. So a vector is the default container. It's, a, it's like an array, but it, it's safe. It knows its size. It reallocates when it has to get bigger. It cleans itself up. So I don't have to do any special allocation here or deallocation so at the end. It's not just a fancy pointer anymore. Yeah, exactly. I have my vector. I then push things back into it, so I'm adding elements to it, and then at the end, I don't have to destroy it explicitly, I don't have to dispose, it just knows. It goes out of scope, and so it cleans up automatically. So I don't need garbage collection for this, it just is scope bound to scope. Now what I'm doing is I have a vector of futures. What this future is, so every element in the vector is a ticket redeemable for an int. In .NET, you're familiar with it as task, mm -hmm. say, of int. In Java, as future of int. We've got that on the uh, screen, don't we? Um, we do, but yeah. let, me, let me actually go, th go through the, the, the pits okay. one by just show what the program does. Okay. And what this lets you do is I have, in this case, a future string, a ticket redeemable for a string, so I can launch an asynchronous operation, get something back right away, but then run concurrently until I need the result. So that's what I'm doing here. So, and I'm going to create three async tasks, each of which flips a string around. And then I'm going to go through, wait for each of those tasks, and print out the result. So the first abstraction you'll notice is future. That is now standard. All of this is portable standard C++11 code, the ISO C++2011 standard mm -hmm. we just published, and that we already support much of the entire standard library in this release, and much of the language, and more soon to come. And first of all, did you notice that I didn't have to put that annoying space in between those template angles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. People don't usually notice that, because not, that's not so much adding a feature as removing a missed feature. So yeah, it works now. It does exactly what you would expect. Async is a nice standard function that just says, spawn off this piece of work. And notice the way I'm, the work I'm spawning off is a lambda function. What this is is a little piece of code which I can treat as an object and pass somewhere. So I don't execute this here and then pass the result. I take the code itself and pass it to, in this case, a function that just launches it potentially asynchronously. I'll come back to that. And I do that with the others. Then I'm going to loop over the results, but instead of having to do the, the old style for uh, vector of future of string colon colon iterator i <laughs> equals v dot begin, et cetera, I can just say for every element in v. And by the way, I'll just deduce the type of that element so I don't have to repeat it again, because I know it's just a future of, just a, a future of string here, but why say that again? Mm -hmm. So I just want for every element of V that I'm going to get a reference to, so not take a copy of, I'm going to output, wait for that. If it's not already available, get will wait on that future, that asynchronous computation mm -hmm. that produces the future result. And so I print it out. Now, you might have noticed that when I call the async function, every single one of these just returns flip of some string. What the flip function does is it takes a string, it reverses it, that's a standard function, turns it backwards, and then returns it. And if you're familiar with C++, you'll know that this, these are by value yep. parameters and return types, which implies a copy. And indeed, in C++ 98, the old standard, this would copy the string on the way in, so take a copy and then throw away the original, reverse it, return a copy, copy it, deep copy, throw away the original, 
which is kind of inefficient, and so you'd have to teach people to oh, watch out for those temporaries. If, you, mm -hmm. if you've done C++ before, you've heard that story. Watch out for those temporaries. Well, it turns out that they're mostly gone now, because in C++11, there's a new feature called move semantics, which you should normally think of as an optimization of copy. And if you'll notice that I'm actually passing here a string literal, that first has to be converted to a string object. But once I've done it, why copy it again needlessly only to throw the first temporary away? If I just write the natural code, C++ now is smart enough to realize that's what I'm doing. I'm just going to move the results of that literal right in there, almost as if it had been just constructed right in place. So with almost zero overhead, just copy the pointers and take ownership of that buffer, not do a deep copy, just shallow copy, steal the guts, since that object's about to go away anyway and I don't need it anymore. And then when I return that string, which has now been modified, same thing happens for free. And so a lot of the time, we can automatically get rid of the copies we would have incurred, get performance by default, and there are other ways to opt in in the places where we wouldn't do it automatically. Yeah, so in this case, I mean, you're not decorating the code at all in exactly. order to indicate that. So move is, move is just happening for free. It's, it's exactly. a compiler optimization, essentially. And in fact, this code is a lot simpler than it would have been in C++ 98, because in C++ 98, we taught people, oh, functions like this should take their parameter by const string reference, you know, things like yeah. that. Oh, and you have to rely on the return value optimization, which nobody should really have to know what that is, to avoid the copy on the way back, and we relied on compiler optimizations. Now you just know it's going to do the right thing, and it's going to be efficient. Now, a few things about this. As you look at the result of this, this is going to print, hello, knowledge chamber, which, of course, is each of these strings backwards when we reverse each one. But did you notice that the order that we get is deterministic? Because we're launching three pieces of async work. Right. We're taking, we're restoring the futures themselves, one for each piece of async work, in the order that we launched them. And then we ask for the results in that order. So everything's deterministic, stays in order even though these three things may execute in some random order. They may execute concurrently on different threads, they can run in parallel, and they can run at different times depending on the scheduler, it doesn't matter. We get nice deterministic results out of clean code. So there are no memory leaks in this code, there are no pieces of boilerplate you had to write by hand just to express a, a normal for loop, and you get asynchrony easily, and you get determinism. Now one last thing. I worked very hard during the C++11 process. Sometimes you work very hard for just like one tiny little thing because if that's right, everything's right. It turns out in the C++11 standard, async has an overridable launch policy. You can force it explicitly to run whatever you give it in a separate thread. Or force it to run on this thread, don't take it anywhere else, which seems kind of weird for async, but yeah. the reason is for debugging. Okay. Sometimes, for debugging, you want to force things just to be more deterministic so you can get you know, repeatable results to track down a bug. You, you generally don't want, ever want that function in shipping code, but it's sometimes useful right. as a debug. But the third option, which is the default, and this is very important, is run anywhere you feel like it. This or another thread. Now, you might have noticed these are very small tasks. They don't actually do much computation. So, there's nothing in the standard that says those have to be taken to some other thread, like a thread pool or something like that to run. Just, this could be run asynchronously. But, if it happens to be cheaper, I can run it just right on this thread. And in fact, if you look at the execution of this on our compiler, because these are such small pieces of work, these actually do run, will run on the same thread, because it's not worth stealing them away to another thread. Uh, we use the concert runtime that the PPL is built on top of, and the task parallel library that will do a work-stealing runtime that lets you express tasks to run, and we spread them across the machine. Unless somebody is ready to steal a piece of work from you, though, and unless it's worth sending somewhere, we just run it right here on this thread, which means that this is going to be screaming fast because we've expressed the async nature, which is still beneficial, because what if later I go and I add more work inside these? That's okay. We'll just naturally start spreading them across the machine. But if I happen to express a small async task, and 99% of the time, it's faster to run just here. It just happens naturally mm -hmm. that way. That's the default. So in, th in this case, you actually could have left off the async on there because it's not necessary for this code. Yes, but, but, but you don't have to think about whether, is this task really too small to run async? Because maybe I could be calling some function and I don't, and I don't know. Maybe it's, right. maybe it's worth having these three run on different, three different cores and then come back together. In fact, if they're only slightly more work than this, it can be worth running them in parallel, but the programmer doesn't have to know. 
reverse or, or flip could be doing something a bit more complicated than that. Could be doing a database lookup or something, or could be doing a com compute intensive operation. And I've very easily expressed that those three things can be spread across the machine. The join points in, are very well expressed. I've got determinism. So this will scale to a multi-core machine. This will be able to if easily uh, directly call natural functions without overhead. This is just a good story. And by the way, that code is as clean and as safe, type safe and memory safe, as in any other modern language. So that's the kind of thing that's new to C++. And so people need to sort of unlearn uh, how painful it used to be, because it was painful. And so it'll take some time for that to happen. That's only natural. Mm -hmm. But a lot of what we used to know about C++, that you got the power and efficiency, but at the cost of it was pretty arcane and hard, a lot of that just isn't true anymore. And that's a message that will take some time for the industry to adopt, but we're hopeful that, it, that people will start getting the word and see that there's quite a bit they can get from C++ and that the pain isn't there either. They can just get the benefit and get their jobs done more quickly and efficiently. Mm -hmm. So if someone in the audience is wanting to take and start using C++, maybe they're currently using VB or C Sharp or some other language that's more of a managed process, mm -hmm. where's the best place to go to find more information about using C++ in modern times? Well, there's a couple of places I can recommend. The first is on NSDN, you can find a, a series of papers that are a, a section of, of topics talk, uh, are entitled Welcome back to C++, or welcome to C++. So for those who already know how to program, in particular, perhaps manage languages or others, that's a great place to go for an overview of, hey, by the way, here's what it's like to program in C++. That way, when they pick up the compiler, they can get up and running more quickly, and that's the goal of that. For those who are coming from some knowledge of the way C++ used to be, and they want to know what are the main things that are new, I've written a, a very short and terse a summary of those things with examples. On my site, you can find it at herbsutter.com, and just look at the top links, and there's an elements of modern C++ style, and it does not cover all of the features of the new standard. It covers the ones that you were going to see all the time, and the, one, the, the dozen that you want to get to know, and we covered many of them here because they're going to make your code clean and safe and fast in just as modern and expressible, and that's what we need more and more, to have that clean and safety with speed and efficiency as we go mobile, as we go to data centers, and as those things, the, those techniques we're using there, more and more pervade the entire mainstream on all devices. Okay, and also we had the, the Going Native conference, which there's videos online. Yes, that that's that. a, thank you for reminding me. That's, in fact, we put on that conference specifically to start gathering information to look at. So Bjarne's keynote is wonderful. There's a nice talk from Chandler Karuth at Google on the Clang compiler, which is another indication of massive investment across the industry, not just at Microsoft, in new C++ tools and investment in C++, the language and the programmers. Mm -hmm. So please go to take a look at that. It's two solid days, single track, but we made sure that was available and we took the trouble of recording it so we'd have something to point to. So thank you for giving yeah. that a shout out. And then also, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Kate Gregory's doing her pre-con yeah. at the Tech Ed, both in North America and Europe, uh, coming up. It's just a day-long session that is specifically diving into the details of C++ for modern programmers. Kate's great to listen to. If yeah. you're there, do not miss that talk. Yeah. And I guess maybe I should dust off my C++ coding skills again and take a look at it again and, and put that C sharp in the, in, the, in the drawer for a while. <laughs> you use the right tool for the right job. Okay. So, okay. But, but welcome back for those parts of your application that benefit from that. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us. Thank okay. you. So hopefully this gave you some insights of why C++ is a language you might want to take a look at again. Uh, so be sure to check out the description of this show where I'll include links to all the information we talked about, uh, Herb's blog, uh, the MSDN stuff, uh, where you can get videos of the Going Native, from the Going Native conference, as well as how you can register for the TechEd pre-conference that's being taught by Kate Gregory. Thanks for joining us.